And when we dance, we dance together under the moon and under the weather. We will lock our eyes forever in the night. Welcome to God is Open. I am your host, Christopher Fisher. On today's episode, we are going to be doing a character study of King Saul, the first king of Israel, the king who preceded King David, who is the star of the Old Testament. He's the pinnacle of Israel's kingship. He's the primary character that everyone looks to and loves. Saul is not given the same amount of love. In in fact, fact, people tend not to like Saul. They view him very negatively. But I think he gets an unfair rap. I think he has his motivations and character... It's an interesting study of someone's descent into paranoia. And we got to remember that his reign spans 40 years. That's 40 years. And uh, his transition is just covered in a few chapters with uh, wild leaps in time frame, uh, chronology. His 40 years are covered in a matter of, I don't know, uh, 20 chapters and just, just choice events from his life mainly his interactions with King David at that. And so it's a very fragmented portrait of a complicated man. So King Saul, King Saul, um, we need to look at him from his selection by God. He's selected by God, and it seems that in 1 Samuel 9, that God's choice of him is because of his stature, his prominence. It says here, And he had a choice and handsome son, this is uh, this is uh, Aphia, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power, and he has a son named Saul who was choice and handsome. Now, this choice is the same word for elect, so I would bet that in the LXX, I haven't checked it out, but I would bet that would be he had an elect and handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upwards, he was taller than any of the people. And this seems to be a repeated theme in this chapter several times. He's described as being taller from the shoulders up over everyone else. So he's tall, handsome, and mighty. And so he's selected by God. Not only that, but he is passionate. It's interesting that uh, we meet Saul and he's sent on a task to go retrieve some missing uh, livestock. And those livestock, it seems to be an entire setup by God in order to get Saul to come to the prophet Samuel in order to get the commissioning by God. And uh, he eventually meets Samuel. He's anointed, and he's anointed as king. The, the people are described as very wicked for wanting a king. So even in these chapters, the kingship is viewed as something God didn't want, God didn't expect it, and the fact that people wanted a king was a rebellion against God. But God, he's he's not so rigid as to not allow what the people want. So he does give in to them. He calls them wicked, and then he goes along with their wishes, their desires. It says this, Tomorrow about this time I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. You shall anoint him commander over my people Israel, that he may save my people from the hand of the Philistines. For I've looked upon my people because their cry has come to me. God has seen uh, all the cries of Israel, and he's looking for someone to unite them. And Saul is a handsome, dashing figure that everyone can get, get behind. But not everyone does. He, he is appointed king, and there is some, some debate about whether he's going to be a good king or not. They seem to be very tribal at this point. Israel, and so they're they're not a unified body. They're not unifying uh, with a, a certain king. They're still scattered tribes following their own allegiances. And Saul, he's very humble. He starts off humble. We see this humility also in David. So being strong, handsome, bold, and humble are all traits that God looks for in leaders. We see it in Saul. We see it in David. And Saul answered and said, Am I not a Benjamite, the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then do you speak like this to me? And so he's he's very humble. He's saying, I'm of this small tribe. Um, I'm just a lowly person, even though he's taller than everyone. He's got some stature. He's got some charisma. He's got some natural, charismatic leadership just based on his physical appearance. And God does seem to value physical appearance in his leadership. Despite what Samuel says about uh, King David, 
when King David is being selected, he says, don't look at all these older boys who are stronger and mightier. God doesn't judge by outward appearances. But the text seems to, it seems to in 1 Samuel 9, uh, say otherwise, where, where, he's, where he's selecting an individual whose shoulders above everyone else. And King David himself is often described as handsome. Uh, he's, he's, he's good to look at. He's very charismatic as well. So despite what the text says, it seems that there is some selection bias based on looks. We have to remember that Saul is not, he wasn't seen as rebellious of God from the get-go. Instead, he is among the prophets. He, he joins up with these prophets and he starts going into this ecstatic trance. And uh, then there's a proverb that starts circling among the people. Is Saul also among the prophets? Because it says the Spirit of God came upon him and he prophesied among him. Later in his life, he'll be seeking after David, trying to kill King David. And he'll come to a certain spot, a certain location, where all, all his people he sent to go get King David, all of them went there and they all came back prophesying. They, they, turned, they turned into prophets. It seems like the Spirit of God was possessing them and forcing them into ecstatic prophecy trances. And this happens also to Saul where he almost becomes possessed. He goes into a static trance and starts prophesying. And this, this proverb is repeated later as well. But Saul is a prophet. He prophesies for Yahweh. He, he gets possessed. He gets in this, these trances, this ecstatic prophecy, where he loses control of himself, his, his faculties, and starts prophesying for God. This, this is depicted as a good thing. So after Saul is anointed, there is a selection process where all the tribes gather together and then they're weeded out, kind of like a lottery thing. And then uh, Saul is found out and it says, therefore, they inquired of the Lord further, because often in Samuel, you'll see inquiries to God. You, you don't know what's happening. You inquire to God. When Yahweh finally abandons Saul altogether, that there's the Witch of Endor incident when Saul's trying to communicate with Yahweh, but Yahweh just will not respond. So he has to resort to different measures. He, he's resorting to trying to go through Samuel to reach Yahweh because Yahweh's not communicating with him directly. But uh, the people, they sought the Lord, and the Lord answered. And therefore they inquired of the Lord further, Has the man come here yet? And the Lord answered, there he is, hidden among the equipment. So they ran and brought him there, and when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upwards. And Samuel said to all the people, Do you see whom the Lord has chosen? There is no one like him among the people. So all the people shouted and said, Long live the king. So it seems it seems the selection has, has something to do with his height and stature. He's a very tall guy. He's probably a very, very foreboding guy, probably muscular. So depictions of uh, Saul against David, I would, I would assume that Saul is a lot bigger and stronger than David. And even in his declining years, he's probably going to be taller than David. And so just think of that as the visual, this big hulking king versus this young crafty David. This is the depiction that we... We kind of we kind of can piece together later, but the the visual imagery is just not described in the later chapters. We have to just piece it together from the text. At the end of this chapter, some of the rebels they're described as rebels, people who don't want to follow God's king. He's, they say, "How can this man save us?" So they despised him and brought him no presents, but he held his peace. So Saul starts out his reign as king as very practically minded, a very reserved. He's, he, he's not prone to anger, retribution, vengeance, and we see this come to play. He's, he's, he's calculated, he's calm, and he's rational. Overall, I would describe Saul as a practical king. He, he wants to get the job done, and he sees ways to get the job done. He sees ways to uh, pander to the people. He sees ways to unify people, and he attempts to uh, construct his kingdom build alliances, and then save those alliances. And this is why the conflict comes in with David, because David is a threat to his kingdom. He's a threat to his alliances and a threat, direct threat to Saul. 
David supplants Saul in the minds of the people, and Saul cannot have that. Saul is practically minded. He is focused and dedicated to preserving his kingdom. But he starts out, and he has to build a unified Israel, unified tribes. And he, you can't do that hot-headed and rash. And so later on, we'll, we'll see how this plays out. So Saul defeats the Ammonites. The Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard this news, that the Amorites are threatening certain cities, and those cities are asking for help. But Saul, Saul is bold. Saul is is uh, enraged. Listen to this. The Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard the news, and his anger was greatly aroused. So he has a strong sense of anger, vengeance, justice when he hears that these foreign invaders are threatening Israelites. And so he took a yoke of oxen and cut them into pieces and sent them throughout all the territory of Israel by the hands of messengers, saying, Whoever does not go out with Saul and Samuel to battle, so it shall be done to his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell upon the people, and they came out with one consent. to, well, This is going to be done to your oxen. Maybe they took it as a direct threat also to their persons. This is probably going to be done to you, too. We're going to hack you up if you probably don't join us. Uh, if, if not you, all, all your oxen, your, your, your ways of preserving your life in this uh, desolate time, you know, this, this very primitive society and where you rely on cattle for survival. And so he's able to put out this mass threat and people respond and they respond in mass to this uh, individual. So he's able to rally the people and assault the Amorites, the uh, Ammonites, and uh, rout them basically. And so after that, all the people become unified under Saul. They love Saul. And then the people said to Samuel, who is he who said, shall Saul reign over us? Now there's indignation against those people, those rebels who didn't want to follow Saul, because guess what? Saul just delivered a great victory to Israel. He's saving the kingdom. He's unifying the tribes in order to protect any one of them. If one of them's threatened, he will unite the tribes to fight that threat. Bring the men that we may put them to death. But Saul said, Not a man shall be put to death this day, for the Lord has accomplished salvation in Israel. What's he doing there? He's taking his former enemies, people who doubted them, him, and he's giving them a second chance. He, he's just shown them that he can lead, that he can rout enemies, that he is the king that they should serve. And now he's giving them forgiveness. He's giving them a second chance. He is going to be solidifying their, their loyalty to him. Here's a man who just showed me forgiveness after I irrationally didn't want to follow him, after I thought he'd be a bad leader, but he just proved himself, and now he's showing me leniency. This is a man that I should follow. He's fair, he's just, and he saved me. From these people, this mob that wanted to put uh, these rebels to death, he is solidifying their loyalty. This is a very good strategy. He, Saul is very practically minded. 1 Samuel 12 is Samuel's farewell address where he actually calls the people evil. He says, Is today not the wheat harvest? I will call upon the Lord and he will send thunder and rain that you may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking for a king for yourselves. Getting a king was wicked. The kingship was not what God wanted. Uh, the people wanted it, and God gave in to their pleadings. And then he reinforces God's everlasting promise, for the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. So that's talking about God's self-image. God loves having a people to his name, uh, and it, it pleases him. There's emotions here. There, there's a there's a emotional connection between Israel and Israel. God. So Saul pretty quickly fights with the Philistines. His entire career, he's fighting against the Philistines. We got to remember this, that this is not a very peaceful time. They got enemies on all sides. And so Saul is described as very warlike. In fact, when Saul dies, David writes a poem about Saul, talking about how he's a man of war. Saul is a man of war. Saul is a fighting man. He's a man's man. Uh, he's, he's not afraid of a little bit of conflict. Uh, he's, he's, he's mighty. He's big. He's, he's fearless. He's bold. 
he will fight. And he fought for 40 years, 40 years. And so we see a bunch of gaps of time that are not filled in in the text. He's fighting for 40 years. But we see this, Saul reigned one year, and then when he reigned two years over Israel, there's this event that happens in which Saul does an unlawful sacrifice. He's, he's supposed to be waiting for Samuel to come, but Samuel does not come, and uh, the people are getting anxious. And so Saul performs a sacrifice himself. After he's done with the sacrifice, that's when Samuel comes to him. So Saul, Saul here is waiting for a sacrifice in order to go to war, but Samuel's delayed. Samuel's not able to come to him in time. Saul does the practical thing. He goes ahead with the, that sacrifice. He needs to save the courage of his men. He needs to give them hope, inspire them to attack, to win the battle. And, uh, you know, Samuel's endangering the entire troop. He's in, endangering morale. They don't even know if he's actually coming. Is he killed? We don't know. Saul goes ahead anyways. And this was disobeying God. He's rebuked by Samuel, and then Samuel says that God's going to take away his kingdom for this. Remember, this is two years into his reign, and he reigned for 40 years. So he reigns for another 38 years after this event, after he's told that uh, the kingdom's being taken away from him. So uh, well, make of that what you will. I don't think that's... Uh, it's a super enforced threat. I don't, I don't think it's something that we take too seriously other than maybe God's planning on, on stopping Saul's lineage or in the, in the kingship. Maybe God's working things behind the scenes. But 38 years later, I don't, I don't think that was the threat that uh, you're going to reign. You, you've reigned for two years. Now you're going to reign for 38 more years. But after that, after that, no more. Maybe. It could be. We could read this this threat that God's going to take away his lineage as he's just not going to have any heirs that take over the throne. And that would be, I think, a valid way to read this, but I don't think it's the best. It says, But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be the commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. So it seems like a replacement text, although this replacement doesn't actually materialize for 38 years later after Saul kills himself in battle. So not not quite the best threat. Was Samuel just saying this? Did it have God's endorsement? We don't see God's endorsement until chapter 15, and that's uh, when we see David being sought out. We see Saul's practicality in practice in the same instance where Jonathan, Saul's son, is fighting the Philistines. And Jonathan is able to lead Israel to a pretty decisive victory. And so um, Saul and his men are just slaughtering the enemy in mass, just killing them everywhere. And uh, Saul is, he, he, he puts out this decree. He's the king. He's making a decree. And he says, And the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had placed the people under an oath, saying, Cursed is the man who eats any food until evening, before I have taken vengeance on my enemies. So none of the people tasted food. So he says, no one can eat food until we're done killing all these people. Anyone who does will be punished. And then guess what happens? Jonathan doesn't hear about this. And Jonathan eats some honey. And so there's, there's some sort of wrath. There's some sort of uh, God is uh, mad at these people. God seems to be enforcing enforcing this kingly command, even though it's just it's just Saul saying something. It's just saying, no one eat until we've driven these people from our land. And then the people do eat. There is some, uh, there's Jonathan. It appears that there's other people doing this as well. And uh, God decides not to be with Israel in taking their enemies, the Philistines, because of it. So God is an enforcer of oaths. Within the Bible, God enforce oaths. It's, it's not based on morality. Not all oaths are moral oaths. Sometimes it's these uh, very ill thought out curses. God enforces oaths. And so God is not with Israel if there's people who are violating the oath of a king, even though the oath has nothing moral or immoral about it. And so uh, Saul says this once it's found out that God is not with them for the attack. 
Come over here, all you chiefs of the people, and no one see what the sin was today. As the Lord lives, who saves Israel? Though it be Jonathan, my son, he shall surely die. But not a man among the people answered him. So he, he makes another bold and rash claim that even if it's his own sons who have been eating against his curse, then his own sons will die as well. So they draw lots, and sure enough, Jonathan comes forward and says, yeah, I, I did eat honey. It's like, I didn't hear about your command. I didn't know about this, so it was done in ignorance. And Saul is practical. Uh, he sees that he's given an oath. He wants to keep his oath. He, wants, he sees that God has turned against him because the people have violated his oath. Saul decides to put Jonathan to death. He decides to fulfill his kingly vow, his, his word, but the people turn against him, and the people don't want Jonathan to die. Remember, Jonathan has just delivered into Israel a crushing defeat of their enemies. He is the hero of the day, and Saul is about to put him to death. This is, this is anathema. This is a terrible thing. This is, it's, it's your war hero that you're putting to death, the person who delivered you, uh, putting on the, the sacrifice uh, pile, the funeral pile. It's, it's not a good thing. It's not a good look. And so when Saul sees the people turn against him, even though he wanted to execute his own orders to the word, he wanted to retain his integrity. He wanted to uh, perhaps align himself with Yahweh in fulfilling his oaths. The people turn against him. And practically speaking, if he loses the love of the people, he loses the kingdom. So he listens to the people. We see him surround himself with advisors and people who give him this type of information and guide his process. And his process is practically minded. He practically wants to follow his own oaths, but he also practically wants to keep his kingdom together. We see his motivations. When we're talking about motivations, it's not a good motivation just to claim someone's crazy or they're irrational and that's what's motivating them to whatever action. Typically, even crazy people have motivations, no matter how irrational, that motivate their actions. So there, there are some motivating factors. There's motivating factors in Saul's erratic behavior later. He sees his kingdom coming apart around him. Remember, he's practically minded. He wants his kingdom to survive. He wants his lineage to survive. He curses his own son later because his son is aligning with David, their chief rival. The people love David. The people love David more than Saul. And Saul sees his own family aligning with this threat to his lineage. And it infuriates him. It infuriates him to murder. To murder, he attempts to murder David throughout his life. I don't know how many years of his life he spends trying to track down and kill David, the threat to his kingdom. So listen to this about Saul. This is praise. This is glowing praise about the reign of Saul. So Saul established his sovereignty over Israel and fought against all his enemies on every side, against Moab, against the people of Ammon, against Edom, against the kings of Zobah, against the Philistines, wherever he turned, here harassed him. And then uh, at the last verse of this chapter, 1452, there was a fierce war with the Philistines all the day of Saul. And Saul, and when Saul saw any strong man or any valiant man, he took him for himself. So that's what Samuel warned about the kings, that that's what the kings would do, is that they would take their sons. They would, they would cause wars. Your sons are going to die. Your sons are going to be in service. You're going to be taxed. These are the traits of a king. And it's being filled out. And Saul likes to surround himself with valiant young men, men who are capable of performing. He creates an elite force, a standing army, if you will, of uh, the best and brightest among Israel in order to fill his ranks. This is how King David gets first attached to Saul. There's, there's two attachment stories, one when he's young and playing the harp, and then he gets recruited by Saul. And then after David kills Goliath, he is also recruited by Saul. He's a petition by David's father, from David's father, Saul petitions to take David into his keep. From here, we get to 1 Samuel 15. Now, this, this is a very important chapter. Uh, we've talked about this a lot because this is God's formal rejection of Saul. More so even than the chapter 13 instance, which doesn't seem to do anything. It doesn't seem to have come to anything. It might have been a warning. It might have just been Samuel being mad. 
uh, we, we don't know what's going on here, but we hear God, God's own voice in Samuel 15. Samuel said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel, therefore heed the words of the Lord. He talks about the Amalekites. Go kill all the Amalekites. Don't spare anything. But Saul kills the Amalekites, and of course they do. And what happened was that Saul was killing all the Amalekites, and apparently the people looked at all the good spoils, and they said, we should keep some of these and sacrifice them to the Lord. Or maybe just keep them. And maybe Saul justified it and says, well, we will give the things that we keep to God, therefore we can keep them. So something like that played out where Saul listened practically to the people who wanted not to destroy everything good and nice and actually have some things to themselves. But Samuel confronts him, and this is a very expertly written little dialogue. There's a lot of little nuances in there back and forth. There's there's an entire physical aspect where Samuel, he, his robes are ripped by Saul, and then he retorts that as Saul ripped Samuel's robes, God is ripping the kingdom from, from Saul. This, this, is, this is what happens where this visual and verbal interplay happen in this very expertly crafted dialogue. And, but there's, there's some interesting things that happen as well. And so, yes, Saul does disobey God. God does repent. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret that I've set up Saul as king, for he's turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. So God is regretting making Samuel king. Samuel communicates this to Saul. And there's this back and forth where Saul is genuinely repentant. A lot of people say, oh, it's a fake repentance. And you know, that's, that's what Saul does, his fake repentance. But we don't get that from the text. In fact, what actually happens is uh, Saul, he, he, he repents such that Samuel believes him. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. So here's the first sign of weakness, really, in Saul. Uh, he's, he's shifting blame to other people. Uh, he's saying, uh, I sinned because I listened to the people. He's putting himself not in a place of agency. He's shifting, shifting agency to other actors, not really taking full responsibility. And so this is the first sign of weakness, other than the whole, you know, Jonathan incident. I don't know if you could count that as weakness, but, but this whole I sin because I'm listening to the people. Please pardon me. That that doesn't sound like agency to me. This is this seems to me where he really starts going downhill. And this is of course his rejection from God, where God Himself says He's rejecting Saul. So it makes sense that this this passage here is his downfall. But let's listen to this now. Therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. Let's scroll down. Does that happen? 1 Samuel 15, 30, Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now, please, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul worshipped the Lord. Saul's worshipping Yahweh. That was Samuel, right after this instance in which the kingdom is removed from Saul. Samuel believes the repentance. Samuel is advocating on behalf of Saul. And towards the end of the chapter, guess who's mourning over Saul? It's Samuel, because Samuel is emotionally attached to Saul. He loves Saul. He wants Saul to be king. And he doesn't want the kingdom pulled away from Saul. And so God has to rebuke Samuel in the next chapter. So let's, let's read uh, 1535. It's a very important verse. And Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. This transitions right to chapter 16. Now the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? See, now I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and go. I'm sending you to Jesse uh, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. In chapter 17, we have the David and Goliath instance in which uh, David, a young kid, goes out and faces a giant. Saul doesn't. Saul stays back. This is another sign of his 
regression, his his uh, his uh, fall from grace, where he's not being bold and taking the initiative. And it has to be this young kid who loves God. And he says, um, what, what does he say? He says, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? So David is bold. David is young. He's ambitious. He wants to go out there. He wants to he wants justice to prevail. He wants this uh, Canaanite to die, a Philistine. He wants this Philistine to die. He wants this Philistine to die. He wants God to be honored. And this is one of the things that Yahweh loves in King David. His, his uh, longing, his emotion, his, his strong emotions, his, his boldness, his willingness to go out and do. David is a doer. Saul seems to take take a backhanded approach here. Saul sits in his tent while he sends other people to do his killing. This is not a bold move. He's, he's on the decline. Saul is losing his boldness, the thing that God loved about Saul to begin with. Saul went out and killed Philistines. Saul went out and killed the Ammonites. Saul was a fighter, and God loved that about Saul. His boldness, his uh, ability to do and accomplish, and once he start, started to lose that regress, David stepped up and he took that place in God's mind. Of course, David rises up in the ranks fairly quickly. He's bold, attractive. He's very charismatic. He draws people to himself. He's very successful in battle. God is with him. And Saul sees this. And there's a saying that goes around, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Saul sees himself being compared to this upstart. Saul's apparently aging at this point, and David is the young upstart who is outshining him in all different classes. And so Saul starts becoming a little bit paranoid. This man is a threat to my kingdom. This man the people love. That Saul only has slain his thousands, David his ten thousands. They love David ten times more than me. This man will be my undoing. This man needs to be put down. He needs to be put in his place. All this man has to do is mobilize the kingdom, and I am done. My dynasty is over. And he sees himself, his own, his own uh, son, aligning with David. This, this infuriates him. He, at one point, attempts to kill his own son. It seems like in this book, a lot of people are very slow learners. Saul attempts to kill David, like half a dozen times before David's like, well, maybe I'll go live with the Philistines for a while because it seems that Saul really wants to kill me even after all these reconciliation uh, attempts. And uh, Jonathan, Saul's son, King Saul's like, we need to kill David. And then uh, Jonathan's like, I think Saul means to kill David. It's like, you don't, you don't think right after he said it, that's what he, that his stated intentions uh, I, it, it, you do believe him yeah, when he says something that that would be good yeah but you, you just have to read it it seems like some something has to happen over and over again for people to register maybe it is that Saul's character is just so fickle and erratic that people just don't know when he's serious about his stated intentions he could be one way one day and a different way another day and there's that, there is that tormenting spirit from God which uh, drives Saul crazy. So people might be seeing Saul as an erratic king who just says stuff that he doesn't actually mean. That, that's, that's my takeaway from this. So Saul's descending into madness during David's ascension. Saul is becoming paranoid. He's actually surrounding himself with paranoid people who advise him to put down David. David has uh, psalms about his enemies are surrounding him, and I don't think it's just Saul. Uh, he's, he's got all sorts of enemies who don't like this young, young upstart, this, this young man who's going to take the throne and take away opportunities from everyone that Saul is promoting. At one point, Saul has people all around him. He's like, is King David going to give you all these lands that I'm giving you? Uh, you guys should be loyal to me. That's the funny thing, that King David didn't actually have to command loyalty through bribery, through uh, benefit and reward. He did it naturally, charismatically. And Saul 
he's relying on more practical means of uh, of uh, securing loyalty of his followers through lands, through through gifts, through through normal normal reward for effort. We see in Saul throughout all this less and less reliance on God. Of course, God has abandoned him. Saul sees this. The text over and over states that Saul sees that Yahweh is with David. Saul attempts to get David killed several times by setting traps for him. He says, how about King David, you can marry my daughter, right? But uh, but I know you're poor and you humbly told me you are poor. So uh, for a dowry, how about you just give me a bag of male genitalia, right? Yeah, that's, that's the worst dowry I've ever heard. Uh, but guess what? It has to be our enemies, the Philistines. And David, he goes and does it. He uh, he collects all the foreskins, and he gives him a bag of foreskins. This is probably the least sought-after scene for any biblical movie that uh, we could imagine. I don't know anywhere in the Bible which would be a more disheartening scene that would... Uh, probably turn off moviegoers than this it's it's a bag a bag of foreskin uh don't if your kids are listening to this don't explain what that is maybe explain what that is but uh it's kind of kind of a weird scene so we see Saul's decline now Saul spoke to Jonathan and his sons and all his servants that they should kill David but Jonathan Saul's son delighted greatly in David and so Jonathan talks him out because Saul actually listens to Jonathan. They have a good relationship. It says that Saul consults Jonathan over very small matters, which is probably part of his fall from grace, where he's not really making his own decisions, and he's heeding the voice of advisors, even Jonathan. He becomes more of a passive person rather than active, controlling king that's making bold, confident decisions. He's he's listening to others. He's, he's delegating his kingly authority for others to make those decisions. It seems to be part of his downfall. We're in chapter 19, and we get to that part where Saul's trying to kill King David, and he keeps sending these people, and uh, they start turning into prophets. And then Saul goes himself, and he becomes spiritually possessed, we will say. And he also went to Ramah and came to the great well that is at Seku. So he asked and said, Where are Samuel and David? And someone said, Indeed, they are at Naoth in Ramah. And so he went to Naoth in Ramah, and then the Spirit of God was upon him also. And he went on and prophesied until he came to Naoth in Raha. And he also stripped off his clothes and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all day and all night, therefore they say, is Saul among the prophets. So he gets this spiritual, uh, very ecstatic uh, visions. He, he, he strips naked and runs around prophesying. This seems to be endorsed in the text. Saul is among the prophets. He becomes ecstatically possessed from time to time in his life. And then, of course, King David, after being trying, after Saul kill, tries to kill David several times, we're in chapter 20, he says, What have I done? What's my iniquity? What is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? And Jonathan, maybe, maybe be, being slow on the uptake, says this. So Jonathan said to him, By no means you shall not die. Indeed, my father will do nothing, either great or small, without first telling me. And why should my father hide this thing from me? It is not so. Uh, King Saul has already tried to kill David several times. And so I, I'm not sure Jonathan's take on the situation is all that acute, all that uh, full of understanding, unless Saul's just an erratic person and Jonathan's speaking in generalities. But we do see in that Saul's reliance on others. He's, he's not making his own decisions. He, his father will do nothing, either great or small, without first telling Jonathan. That's not the sign of a de- decisive man in full control that he's constantly seeking approval and advice from others. Maybe once in a while, maybe major things, but not on everything. Not, not a leadership quality. We're going to get to a tragic point in Saul's life in which he kills a bunch of priests. The priests shelter and feed King David. Saul calls all these priests in front of him. He commands his, his men 
to kill these priests for sheltering King David. Uh, his men refuse, so he turns to Doug the Edomite. Don't name your kids Dueg. Doug? Doug? Doug the Edomite. So Doug the Edomite turned and struck the priest and killed on that day 85 men who wore the linen ephod. So Saul kills 85 priests. This is this is a massacre. This is a tragedy. And the, probably the low point in Saul's life. Remember, Saul's crimes up to this point are, besides his erratic behavior and trying to kill David for very paranoid reasons, his crimes are... Uh, doing a sacrifice when a prophet doesn't show up in the time frame allotted, and then also keeping spoils of war, which were to be dedicated to God, where God said just to destroy everything. So those are those are his two prior main crimes. But he seems to go full out here and just start slaughtering priests of God, which is an affront. Even his men will not do this. We have several reversals in the text. Saul is constantly seeking King David. And there's this cat and mouse game in which King David keeps showing Saul that he has the upper hand, that he could have killed Saul at any point. And every time that King David points this out to Saul, there's a reconciliation. And there's a reconciliation where Saul cries out, and here's an example. Is this your voice, my son, David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. And so there's this genuine repentance, this emotional outburst where Saul realizes how evil he has been towards David. And David has had all these opportunities to kill him. David has not taken those opportunities. And so Paul's paranoia is coming face to face with the reality of the situation in which his paranoia is unjustified. Everything that he thinks is going to materialize does not materialize when it has the chance. His his uh, beliefs, his internal belief system is bumping up against reality and he's having this meltdown in such a way that he repents very publicly and passionately to King David. But King David starts to get the hint that this is going to keep happening over and over, in which uh, Saul's going to one day change his mind and say, you know what, um, maybe maybe King David is now going to turn on me. After all, I did try to kill him. I did try to chase him down. And uh, even though he showed me that he wouldn't kill me then, he might kill me now. After he has had some time to think about it, I better put him down first. You know, these types of thoughts are probably going on in Saul's mind. He's practically minded. He wants to keep the kingdom. This David is his biggest threat. His biggest threat is King David. A person who probably is being sought out, probably associating with Samuel, who also priorly said to Saul that God was seeking out a new king. There's a lot of good evidence there that that person is David. And so Saul's not totally unjustified in his beliefs, which is affirmed by the text in which David is anointed to be the next king. Saul is not unjustified in his beliefs. His beliefs are accurate. King David will be the next king, and King David will replace Saul. Saul's trying to stop that from happening. We get to chapter 28. This is when Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. God's abandoned him. His enemies are on all sides. This is overwhelming forces. God's not responding. And this is the witch of Endor in which Saul, after expelling all the witches, finds through Cognito a witch who still remains in order to summon up Samuel to try to get a response from God. And what does Samuel say? That you're going to die. Saul, you will die in your war with the Philistines. And Saul does die, him and his children. It's, that's also very tragic. Jonathan had no reason to die. He is very much aligned with David. He is a very good character, a character that we love, who's good-natured and has a lot of integrity. And he dies as well as Saul. And King David, he laments all of this because Saul is God's anointed. Whether or not King David is also anointed, whether or not King David is replacing Saul, Saul is God's anointed. So the individual who helps or claims, claims to have helped Saul commit suicide, David kills that individual for killing God's anointed. David also is a man of integrity. He's strongly impassioned towards Yahweh. Uh, he believes what Yahweh says is sacred, what Yahweh 
does is sacred and man does not have the right to undo what God does. So that's a quick overview of the life of Saul. I think he's often portrayed more negatively than he should have. Uh, he was a man who's abandoned by God for what seems to be petty reasons and uh, things start to go south in his life. And then he becomes increasingly paranoid as a result. And his paranoia was not unjustified. He was a man who was practical in his day, in his youth. He was bold. He was charming. He was dashing. He led a lot of victories for Israel. Uh, overall, for 40 years, he kept Israel safe and unified. I think a lot of times we give him a worse rap than he's due. Uh, Saul led Israel for 40 years, unified against various enemies, kept Israel safe. He was a unifying force. He, he was a man of war, as King David recounts. 40 years cannot be captured very well by a short book that you could read in, in about an hour or so. And so there's a lot of events in Saul's life that we're not privy to. It is sad that he descends into madness. It is sad that he attempts to kill his most loyal servants. It's sad that uh, he does massacre prophets of God. Uh, these are low points in his life. And he falls apart at the end. And he has a very humiliating death at the hands of his enemies. That King David steps up and he rectifies the situations. And then King David carries the mantle to fight the Philistines. But anyways, I, I just wanted to cover the life of Saul. I think uh, Saul should be given more empathy. We should sympathize with Saul and understand his plight, understand what he is facing, understand conflicting motivations, his allegiance to God, his practicality concerns in uniting the tribes, his uh, uh, effort to protect Israel, and his strong desire to keep his lineage, to keep uh, his line uh, going. And all these motivations, uh, they, they sometimes are at cross purposes. He has to make decisions. Not all his decisions are the best decisions, especially in hindsight. A lot of uh, David's decisions in hindsight were good, but uh, Saul's similar decisions in hindsight were bad. So it's just a roll of the dice sometimes. Sometimes it's just favoring by God. God favors David and not Saul later in Saul's life. Early in Saul's life, Saul is the favored one, but he falls from grace. And once he falls from great grace, Yahweh abandons him. God abandons him in favor of others. And that's when it really starts to fall apart for Saul. It, it falls apart 40 years later, 40 years later, but it does fall apart. Anyways, questions, comments, put that below. Thank you for listening.